माननीय वाइस चांसलर डॉक्टर डेका माननीय प्रोफेसर अहमद रेजिस्ट्रार के के खंडिक स्टेट ओपन यूनिवर्सिटी प्रोफेसर और छात्रगण विशेष अतिथि सबके मोर नमस्कार आई एम भेरी हेपी टू वि हियर अलग टपिक तो टेक्निकल मैं इंगराजी कह कार्य मोर खकोजा लग जा आई एम भेरी हेपी टू वि हियर ऑन द बर्थ एनिवर्सरी ऑफ अ फेमस सन ऑफ असम मानिकांत काकुति From what I know, he did extremely well in Calcutta University in those days, in early 20th century, almost 100 years ago, as a student of English, Sanskrit, and later on he has made a number of contributions to Assamese literature. I also believe to comparative religion. and since he was born on this particular day 15th of november i will not say anything about when he passed away today we want to celebrate his birthday so i literally bow my head in admiration and in respect for manikanta kakoti having said that now i am going to not talk about his areas of strength because those are not areas that i have studied and know something about i will talk about india's financial sector but i will talk about it in <coughs> fairly simple general terms and what i would like the audience to do today is to put up your hand he or she whoever it is and stop me and say that term you have used i do not understand please explain i have been told by the vice chancellor the honorable vice chancellor and by professor ahmed that this is the only main activity today and i hope nobody is in a hurry because i don't intend to finish quickly you have to tell me to stop so whenever you tell me to stop i will stop in the meantime stop me whenever you want to ask a question and for the younger people here as your professors tell you there is no such thing like a stupid question all questions are welcome howsoever elementary but don't go away without understanding what i have said i am told that today's lecture is being recorded i have assured professor ahmed that i do not need for it to be corrected i am very happy for him to put it on youtube moment while lecture is over i have nothing to retract or to change once i have spoken i have spoken that's about it <laughs> so let us see what is the financial sector the financial sector in formal terms consists of banking there are banks you are all familiar with banks so there is the banking sub sector there is the capital markets sub sector what are the capital markets capital markets consists mainly there are many elements to it of the stock markets debt markets and derivatives markets stock markets is those of you who are old enough to remember an old hindi movie called satta bazaar most of you young people will not know this movie called satta bazaar satta in in colloquial hindi means shares or equity so the gentleman in this movie he invests in stocks so stocks go down in price he is devastated because he has lost his entire wealth that is the caricature of stock market so capital <coughs> markets are equity markets debt markets when government issues a bond or a corporate issues a bond i am deliberately going slowly and in very simple terms because i am trying to reach those who are the least well informed here in the hall I know some of this will be irritating for those who are far better informed so please bear with me So the stock markets debt markets derivatives markets derivatives are not get into the detail these are securities which are based on debt or on equity We have a 
piece of legislation called the Securities Contract Regulation Act of 1956. In the year 2000, when I was working in the finance ministry, I deliberately add a few stories here, otherwise you'll all go to sleep. <laughs> so, uh, and particularly in the hall, you know, they're putting down the lights. In the year 2000, uh, Mr. Atal Bihari Vajpayee was the prime minister. <coughs> Mr. Yashwan Sinha was the finance minister. And I was one of the joint secretaries in the Ministry of Finance. As Professor Ahmed said, in those years, I was on the north side of Rajpath. Those of you who are familiar with Delhi know that Rajpath begins at India Gate and ends at Rashtrapati Bhavan. The north side of Rajpath, you have North Block and you have Parliament House. On the south side of Rajpath, you have Prime Minister's Office, Ministry of External Affairs and the Ministry of Defence. And if you go further, you'll find the Prime Minister's house itself. <laughs> Earlier it used to be called Race Course Road, now it's known as Lok Kalyan Mar. We have changed the name, hopefully many other things will change and we'll progress. But coming back to the story of derivatives. You see, India did not have derivatives. And many felt that we don't need these kinds of instruments, they're very dangerous. There was a British bank called Bering, and you can look up on Google what was Bering's bank and how it collapsed because of the activities of one rogue trader called Leeson. So when I proposed in the ministry that India needs derivatives, I'll not get into the technical details of why India needs derivatives. It is to get rid of certain kind of trading called Badla, which used to happen in Mumbai, in the Bombay Stock Exchange. When I wrote up the paper for the introduction of derivatives, and I said, instead of trying to introduce fresh legislation, let us change the definition of securities to include derivatives. So we did that, legislation was ready. On a given day, the minister, Yashwan Sinha, was going to introduce the legislation in the Lok Sabha. By definition, it's a money bill. Nowadays, there's a lot of controversy of what is a money bill, is Aadhaar part of money bill or not and all that. But definitely, derivatives is part of what you could consider a money bill, so it doesn't need the approval of the Rajya Sabha. I get an urgent call from the private secretary to the minister. In uh, Delhi, as you know, is very much part of North India, and the way the private secretary talks is like this. Sir, Mantri ji yaad kar rahe <laughs> Yaad kar rahe Very good, let him keep remembering me. No, what, what he is basically saying is, pick up whatever you have and run. Go to the Mantri ji. Yaad kar rahe means he needs you. So, kaha hai Mantri ji? Mantri ji parliament house. I said, mere ko time lagega. Parliament, as you know, not as much security as now, but even... Then it was a lot of security, you, know, you have to give your bag in here, your mobile phone, you have to put there. So he said, no, 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 he said, Mantri ji ke gaadi khadi hai bahar. So his own car has come to take you because then it has got some special <coughs> stickers on it so you can zoom through. So I went in, I rushed to his room. <coughs> so he looked up at me, he was looking at some, okay, Jemini, tell me what are derivatives? I'm going to introduce this legislation, I don't know anything about derivatives, please explain derivatives. This is the, this is the real world. So he's not embarrassed at all. He's the minister. He's not supposed to know what are derivatives. So I kind of rubbed my hands with great happiness. I said, okay, the minister wants to know about derivatives. Let me tell him about... By the way, I have a PhD in finance, so it's a, you don't need a PhD to know about derivatives. But I said, now is my chance. I have the minister here. So I started off, I started explaining, five, ten minutes explained. Then he put up his hand. I said, sir, I haven't finished. There's so much more to tell you. He smiled at me in a very benign manner and said, Jaimini, now I know more than all the members of parliament. I don't need to know as much as you. I must know more than them. That's all. So that, that is how that piece of legislation went through for derivatives. So now this is a long way of telling you what are capital markets. So then we move on to another aspect, which is very important for everyone. You're all very young there at the back, but all of you will at some stage need pensions. So there is a pension sector. And there is a regulatory agency for that now called PFRDA. And the fourth sector is insurance. That you need even if you are young. Pensions you only need if you are old. But insurance everybody needs. So these are the four subsectors of the financial sector. And why do I say that our financial sector is stressed? 
mainly the, the largest sector out of these four sectors is the banking sector. And within the banking sector, 70% of the bank, I will not get into the definitions of how 70%, any round number you should be suspicious of, 70% of the <coughs> sector is the public sector banks. And I think it's a good thing. I would like to disabuse those of you who think that uh, <coughs> Professor, and he's a, a good friend of mine, P.J. Naik is right, where he has written a, a report at the, at the request of the government where he suggests privatization, greater privatization of our public sector banks. I'm totally opposed to it. I have spoken a number of times about it. And I'll repeat for the benefit of the younger people who might feel that the private sector is all good and the public sector is all bad. It's human beings who are good or bad, not any sector. The, uh, as you know, in 2008, when you had the breakdown in the financial sector starting from the United States with the Lehman Brothers uh, collapsing, those are all private sector banks. Even today, the Royal Bank of Scotland, which was a 100% private sector bank, is 80% owned by the government of the United Kingdom. So let's not get into this public sector, private sector. The private sector, everything is right because competition makes everything right and public sector, everything is bad because government employees don't work. They go to office at 11, then they have chai, then they have samosa, then it's time for lunch and then they go home at 2.30. That is a caricature. Maybe it happens in some places, but many places it does not. So that is to bring home the fact that 70% of our banking being in the public sector is not the problem. In I will not go into the history of earlier problems of Indian banking sector. I will speak about the stresses now. These stresses had their origin somewhere around 2007-2008. At that time, the government felt that 2009... I am going to here say things which may sound politically unacceptable. I am a retired person. I am in a think tank, but I am no longer with government. So I say it as frankly as I can think of. So please do not take offense if you are a votary of this party or that party. <laughs> uh, so in 2007-2008, the party in power, and I don't have to tell you who was in power, but I have not mentioned it either. The government in power decided that in one and a half years to two years, the elections are coming in 2009. And the party at that time had about 145 seats in Lok Sabha and had formed government and they were hoping to increase the number of seats. So they said one way of getting people to like the government in power is to push credit. That means push money out of the door to large, medium, small and micro enterprises. So between 2008 and 2013 or so, the public sector banks particularly were encouraged to get into what was then known as public-private partnerships to build infrastructure, whether it is power plants, whether it is roads, whether it is airports and so on. Now, none of, this thing, none of these things sound as if there is something wrong with it. It's, it's all good. We need more roads, we need more power plants. Actually, nowadays we don't need more power plants because, just as an aside, you may not know it in Assam because there may be power cuts here in Guwahati, but the total installed capacity of power in India is 300 approximately gigawatts. One gigawatt is a thousand megawatt. And our total power consumption is 200 gigawatts. I'm giving it in round numbers. 300 gigawatts is installed capacity. 200 gigawatts is actually power being consumed. That's because you have certain pockets where there is surplus power, certain pockets where there is deficiency in power and you need power grids uh, to work efficiently to bring the power from where you have more power to places where you have less power. But coming back to the banking sector and its crisis or near some difficulties today, the stress, I use the word stress because it's less than a crisis but it is not a very happy situation. <coughs> So the stress comes from the fact that there was a lot of lending and some of those borrowers are not in a position to pay back the loans that they took. That is, the, that is what, in a simple nutshell, that's what the crisis is all about. A bank has, State Bank of India or any bank, I mean State Bank is relatively better off, but some of the other banks 
like Bank of India and so on, they are in much better, worse shape, they are smaller banks. They have lent money to company X or company Y and that company X or Y, I would recommend to those who are students of economics to go back and look at the economic survey of about, economic survey comes out as you know just before the budget every year, is the job of the chief economic advisor to bring it out. To look at the numbers there, how concentrated, how few borrowers have borrowed so many lakh crores and are not in a position to give it back. Was this crony capitalism? Was it an example of, I'll not get into those things, that is for others to find out. But the basic problem is that anywhere near 12 lakh crores, you can quickly take out a pen and pencil and write it down, 12 lakh crores is the total volume of stressed assets in the country today. To give you a sense of what this is like, our gross domestic product is about 140 lakh crores. If it was exactly 10%, it would have been 14 lakh crores. These are round numbers. And experts will disagree with each other about these numbers. Not even laypersons, but even experts will disagree. So 140 lakh crores, ek lakh kuti taka, jathesta taka, most of us will not see it in this lifetime. <laughs> So 140 or so lakh crores. I think it's a billion or a goal, but I am an old person, so I am still in crores and lakhs and things like that. I think it's a million, billion or a goal. I can translate that to into billions also, but anyway. So that is the size of the non-performing assets on the books of mostly our public sector banks because those are the banks who do the long-term lending. It is somebody might come and oh, HDFC bank or equity day nae, mane Kotak Mahindra has. They don't lend long term. Most of their lending is all short term working capital lending. Working capital key mane some company goes and needs a loan for six months or one year or maximum two years. That's all short term loans is what the private banks do. So the public sector banks are all the, doing overwhelming amount of the longer term lending. So if anybody tries to tell you that the private sector, sector banks are fantastic and the public sector banks are very bad, you have to point out that they have been doing most of the lending for long term. Long term loans are no need yet. So having said that, so once this government came to power, uh, this piece of legislation was in the works for a long time. Das Pranavas as I mentioned, if you look at the second bullet point, 2016, we got the IBC, the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. What does it do? It provides a recourse for the creditor, that is the lender. If you are a bank X and you have lent 50,000 crores to the Ruiya, Ruiya ma koinim, Ruiyas are thugs. So even if there is media, you can quote me on that. So the Ruiyas uh, are totally irresponsible businessmen. They borrowed lots of money and they never repay any money. That is their standard practice. They go to court and say, okay, just, it'll go on. Let it go on for 10 years, 20 years. In the meantime, you know, something else will happen. Government might change, some other change might happen. The Ruiyas uh, and people like them do not repay the loans. And the banks can do nothing because it go, gets stuck in a court. So parliament approved the insolvency, it's called the IBC. The short form for that is IBC, Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. This basically replaced the SICA, the SIC Industrial Companies Act of 1985. That was a SIC Act because all it did was to provide a means for those borrowers who don't want to repay. I've spoken about the excessive credit expansion since 2008. And one of the elements of the IBC or the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Court process, you can put up your hand if I'm giving you too much detail and you are getting lost. I can then gloss over some of these things, but I think it's important to understand the nuances and the details. Otherwise, you don't fully understand what the whole situation is. So, and you will not understand what's going to happen on the 19th of November when the RBI board meets in Mumbai. As you know, there have been fireworks, at least in the newspapers and in the media, between the Reserve Bank of India and the government. What I'm telling you is the 
underlying are the underlying issues on which there are differences of opinion between the Reserve Bank of India and Government of India. So, if you now want to take a borrower to court, you have to take them first to the National Company, Company Law Tribunal. You don't go to a Sessions Court or to a High Court and definitely not to the Supreme Court because that is the last resort. You go to the NCLT. There are NCLTs in many of the major towns of India where you go. But even the NCLT process was taking a lot of time. So then last year, now we are in 2018, in March 2017, the RBI, I'll not get into the, what they did earlier, they went in for something called prompt corrective action norms, under which the <coughs> banks, those who have lent money, could literally take prompt action. They could go to the committee of creditors, and they could initiate this action in the NCLTs with a view to recovering their money. If a resolution professional, I think I'm going to lose the audience if I get into further technical details, there is an Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India called IBBI. They are supposed to look at these cases. Just think there are multiple bodies which have been set up under the Insolvency, un, under the IBC, Insolvency Bankruptcy Code Law, to bring borrowers to book, to a court, and if they can't repay, then their property, that means their company is taken over by the committee of creditors, and it is sold, suppose they borrowed 100 rupees. The company is taken over, and it is sold, and you get only 60 rupees. So the lenders will now distribute the 60 rupees as per whatever loans they had given. So they have lost 40 rupees, there is nothing to be done. But if you just sit on it for another 20 years, that 60 rupees will become 10 rupees. Because they have further siphoned off from that company whatever little value it had. So that is the whole process. The lender will never get back the 100 rupees because that company is already in default, it is in trouble. So this is what has happened now and the RBI is trying to take prompt corrective action and under this prompt corrective action, 11 public sector banks have been told you cannot lend even one more rupee. You are in trouble, no more lending till your books are healthier. And it's, as I've said, the public sector banks are in greater, greater trouble. Uh, we'll not get into the details of net NPAs and so on. For some reason, this works, this doesn't work. Okay. We'll come to NBF non-bank finance companies in a minute. You don't have to really follow all this because I have already provided this to the university. You can always ask for the slides. It's one email away from you. In fact, the university can even put it somewhere where anybody can access it. What do lending institutions do? They get money from the public if you're a bank in the form of deposits. Where do you keep your salary? You keep it in a bank. And the rate of interest which they give you is lower than the rate of interest they charge to their borrowers. That's the simple thing. And all this is done through something known as maturity transformation. What is maturity transformation? The banks borrow short and lend long. And there is obviously a maturity mismatch and therefore risk. Well, how do I mean they borrow short? When you put your money in a savings account, you can take out your money at any time. Suppose there's only one account holder, you put in 10 rupees and you can take it out any time and the bank lends 10 rupees and then tomorrow you go back and say, give me 5 rupees, the bank cannot give it to you because 10 rupees it has lent to company X and that company X has invested in some particular business and they have borrowed it for 10 years. So this is what I call maturity transformation. So all banks borrow short, but then there are millions of depositors. All of them will not ask for their money right away. That is the whole game. So you don't lend all of it. So this is all that financial. So if somebody tells you I'm a very bright man and I work in a bank and I'm a big short and I know a lot, that's all there is to it. It is not something very technically difficult to understand. 
this maturity transformation and riding the yield curve means that if you look at interest rates, most of the time, the short term interest rates are lower than the longer term interest rates. What do I mean by that? If you put in a deposit in a public sector bank, as all of you know, if you put in a one year deposit, you'll get 6%. If you put in a 10 year deposit, you might get 8%. I don't know what the rates are right now, depend, depending upon senior citizen status or whatever, the rates of interest may be different. So this is riding the yield curve. The yield curve is always upward sloping like that. There are exceptional circumstances when it may not go upwards. There are liquidity issues, but we will not get into those technical issues. By and large, shorter term <coughs> borrowings and loans have lower interest rates than longer term. And that's all banks are doing. And by and large, when banks lend, they trust the borrower to repay the money. But the problem happens when the banks don't insist on transparency. So trust, if you see the last bullet point, trust has to be accompanied by transparency. Unfortunately, in many situations, not just in our country, in so many countries, trust is not accompanied by transparency. Sometimes it is not trust at all, it's a question of collusion between the banks and the borrowers, the government as the largest shareholder of our public sector banks, and from our parliamentarians, and from our members of legislative assemblies, that they in turn must ask for transparency. We must ask for greater transparency. We must ask for the numbers to be put out in a manner which is readily understandable. Uh, so the finance minister must do it in the national parliament over here. In the state assembly, whoever is responsible needs to put those numbers out so that everybody can understand what is going on. It's not difficult once it is broken down into little bits. So that's what the situation is right now between the crisis or the difficulties. Are the differing perceptions of Reserve Bank of India and government between solvency and liquidity? Government is saying that there is not enough liquidity in the market. What do I mean by liquidity? Jiman taka thaki bola ke banker hatar karva di bola jiman nae liquidity nae banker ta taka to nae. Asal hai banker ta bahu taka hai. Particularly after demonetization, tarar ta capital nae. Kibara jitia when you have to give a loan, bank must have reserves of capital to be able to give loan. The capital is called risk capital. I'll not get into the details of. Basel norms and all that, there are which the RBI has adopted. You must have some risk capital. Why? Because when you lend and it doesn't come back, you use your risk capital to pay your depositor. So what has happened is that the banks have a lot of liquidity, in my opinion. They don't have enough capital. And the government is telling RBI, do something, push some loans out. Uh, there are the SMEs are in trouble, the MSMEs are in trouble and they need more liquidity and there is not enough lending happening. RBI is saying it's not a question of liquidity, just to talk about bank or talk. credit worthiness or What is credit worthiness? The bank is not satisfied that you'll repay the money. Suppose I go to the bank and say, please give me 10,000 crores, I'm going to set up a huge, huge, huge petro chemical plant. Bank will say, oh, sorry, thank you, please go, we don't have time to talk to you. 10,000 crores, what for? What do I, what do you know about petrochemical industries or what is your track record? That's what I mean by the bank having the money. They could give me 10,000 crores, but I don't have the profile or the ability to convince them that I can service that debt in a timely manner. This is RBI's position. The government's position is, no, 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 please lend, please allow more lending. Now, both are right in a way because right now we need more economic activity. It's only when an economic activity will only happen if there is lending because most of the time you may not fully realize this. Economic activity happens through lending, not through people using their own capital. That is the whole thing of capitalism that they don't use their own capital. They use your and my capital. Whatever we put into banks is what capitalists use 
to create industries and to create employment, and we all want employment. So this is the crux of the dispute between RBI and the other things are not relevant. I'm not going to get into the February of this year circular under which RBI is saying that moment any entity does not repay a loan, the same day that loan must be recorded as a loan which is tagged, not as non-performing asset or non-performing loan, but at least it's tagged as a loan on which payments have not been made. In a nutshell, eight way asol kotha. Government ko se out lending ho bolenge, RBI ko se ami to bata diya na hai. Jodi bank ke dibo kuchh hai, dibo par hai. Kintu bank ke to sabo mene yao takaro bata dibo pari banana na hai. Will they ever give it back? And we don't want to. We are the regulator. We are not going to force banks to lend. And government is saying you should encourage. If not anything else, you should open your own lending window. RBI ko se ami kya lending window ko bolenge. So these are some of the issues which will be discussed on the 19th of November, which is only four days away. So watch out for the newspapers on the 20th. I have been requested already by ET now and by CNBC to give interviews on the 19th. I have told them. They just rang me up a little while ago and I said, please, please, you know. Edu kiba hiri tamasa na hai na hai man esam, they are fighting and ami sabay goplai sabo lage ta hato juddho nu kiyo se. Because it is not in our interest for there to be such differences between the regulator and the government, very frankly. It is not in our interest as citizens. We want this issue to be resolved in a way that banks lend, but do not lend to such people who will never repay the money, because that is our money. It is the depositor's money. Ultimately, the government will uh, provide the money by taxation. By taxation meaning the, the tax rupees that we give the bank. That is the only way that government can provide it. I'll shift gears now. So this is roughly the situation in our domestic financial sector. And these are some of the issues uh, which, on which the government and RBI have differences. I'll move on to trade. Please. Sir, you are saying, sir, that, um, that both, both of them are correct. Government is also correct. Also, RBI is correct. Right. In between, many things are happening, sir. Right. Right now. But if you see, sir, that a uh, lot of money is going out of this country. Right without being paid back to the banks who have lent it, actually. Right. Everybody knows about it. There is nothing to read. So, now, sir, since you are saying that these are both correct, which are more correct, I want to know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, you have brought in another element, which is leakage of capital out of the country. Yes, sir. I didn't even get into that. Okay, sir. The issue is that you would not know who's more correct unless you are both in RBI and in government. Because the, ultimately these are technical issues. Uh, government is saying that RBI has about 3.5 lakh crores of surplus reserves. Why are reserves held by the central bank of a country? They are ultimately the lender of last resort. So there is a framework which you will only be able to understand if you are running those numbers in a risk model. In a certain scenario, if so many banks collapse, then RBI has to put in so much money. So RBI has come up with a calculation that it needs about 9, 10 lakh crores. Government is saying you only need about 5, 6 lakh crores. Now, I believe that there will be a presentation made on the 19th of November for government to give its point of view. So this quickly becomes a technical issue. So when I say both are correct, both are correct in the sense of, from their point of view, RBI is saying, I need so much money, otherwise I am at risk of not being able to fully perform all my responsibilities in the case of a crisis. Government is saying, you have enough. We know you have enough, even if there is a crisis. Now, this is not something which can be debated at a general level, and it has to be then debated between experts. Now, your, thir your other point in terms of money going outside, well, money goes outside in a variety of ways and it has less to do with the current situation. That is a constant situation where some unscrupulous elements look to siphon money away from... Even if you're getting your... I know of people who have huge houses in Delhi who give their houses on rent to embassies and ask for a part of the rent outside the country. And some embassies oblige them. 
with that because then they reduce the rent a little bit. So what I'm saying is that once you go into that business of money going outside, then there's all this thing about under invoicing of of, of uh, exports and over invoicing of imports. You know, I'm sure the students of economics know what I mean by that. Suppose you're exporting ten dollars worth of something, you price it only at eight dollars. That external party puts two dollars into your Swiss bank account. Because what you've exported is worth $10. He knows, the importer. But what does government do? How does government stop this? Well, you say, no, but I, I've been only able to find a buyer at $8. You're selling two shirts for $8 when actually they're worth $10. And $2 is given to you into your Swiss bank account or into your Cayman Bank's account or your Mauritius account. You know, those are, I'm not getting into that. Those are other issues. There are many complications about and how money goes out of the country. We'll not go there because otherwise uh, we'll be here till tomorrow morning <laughs> discussing, <laughs> discussing all these issues.